it's all well and good getting a brilliant team together and setting out an exciting mission, purpose and vision. But if you don't ensure everyone's on the same page, pulling in the same direction and aligning their objectives, well, then you're just a bunch of people working in close proximity with a general idea of where you're heading. And the common refrain I hear in biotech is it's difficult to set consistent objectives in R&D. Things change so much and so quickly. But honestly, I don't buy it. Things change rapidly in any small company, but it doesn't diminish the value of clear, aligned objectives. You'll need to adjust and reset when things go wrong in the lab or the clinic, but a defined picture of what needs to be done remains just as crucial for scientists as for anyone else. Without aligned objectives, productivity suffers. Partly this is down to unconscious duplication of effort. I remember years ago sitting next to my boss and it was only after a couple of hours that we realised we were both doing exactly the same thing separately. But it's more pervasive than just duplication. In a Harvard Business Review study, employees in organisations with aligned objectives were found to be 29% more motivated to perform well at work. So alignment drives discretionary effort too. Business performance takes a hit when objectives aren't aligned as well. Gallup found that highly engaged teams are 21% more profitable. And another HBR article discovered that companies with highly aligned employees saw a 24% increase in three-year revenue growth. Misalignment leads to higher levels of staff turnover, again decreasing productivity. And a report from PwC states that 61% of CEOs believe a lack of alignment among senior leadership is a barrier to them achieving their business goals. The well-publicised declines of Nokia and Yahoo have been partly credited to lack of alignment. In Nokia's case, between its hardware and software strategies, and at Yahoo, based in their frequent shifts in strategic focus. So alignment equals performance. But how do you achieve it? Well, everything starts from clear strategic objectives at a corporate level. And I've spoken in the past about the importance of a long-term mission and vision, these need to be translated into clear 12, 24 and 36 month outcomes that can be measured and monitored. Smart goals, which are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic and time bound are a great fit here. And those strategic objectives should be communicated consistently with progress updated and must be accessible to all levels of the organisation. Corporate goals then need to be split up into departmental priorities with clear links to the company objective they're supporting. And again, SMART is the way to go with these. It's either a number or a yes, no outcome that you're looking for when you set those goals. And once these have all been digested by your team, then ask them to define how they feel they can best contribute individually to those department and company level goals. Prepare your version of what you think their personal objectives should be separately and compare notes. Remember that what they propose might well be better than what you've suggested, so this should be a very open discussion. Now, the OKR format has become popular recently for individual objective setting, and it works well. If you've not used it before, start with the high-level objective. What will they achieve, and how does that support the priorities of the department and the organisation? Each person should have a maximum of three to five objectives. More than that becomes really difficult to manage. And once those objectives are agreed, determine then the key results that will tell you whether or to what extent the objective has been achieved. As before, each key result should be measurable with a number or with a yes, no outcome. And each objective must be linked to a higher level goal. When your OKRs have been agreed, let your team member go away and develop a plan for achieving them. It's not up to you as a manager to provide the how, although you should absolutely help them refine it by asking questions, by challenging assumptions, and by providing relevant information. But as long as you're satisfied that the actions that have been suggested have a strong chance of delivering the OKR, let it be their plan, not yours. With your team's OKRs now in place, it's important to check for duplication. And that might result in another draft, a suggestion for people to work together or to share the load with each other, or maybe even two different approaches that you can test to see which delivers the best result. Just make sure there's no unnecessary effort. If everyone has five OKRs, 
Each one is 20% of a person's focus, and that's a lot to waste. As mentioned already, there's a widely held belief that it's difficult to set OKRs in R&D. And of course, it's not as straightforward as in sales, for example, where everything has a number and it's easy to see the results. The system still works, however, as long as there's regular review. As soon as it becomes apparent that an objective is no longer relevant or possible, scrap it, document the change and replace it with something new. This can be an agile process as long as it's kept alive by both the employee and by the line manager. This review methodology applies outside of R&D too. And if it seems like scrapping and resetting objectives is a waste of time, remember that it's, it's not about success or failure, but it's about clarity and alignment. Those things drive performance, engagement and retention. And even if you hit 55% of your objectives over a year, you'll see huge forward momentum.